Men to the Sizzle. Good morning. My name is Hesaf here. Welcome to Fox on Wednesday podcast. Quick greet to the CLR. My name is Seth and Mike. My name is and Mike here. I'm with the Fox on Wednesday podcast. So today. Woo! Ladies and gentlemen, welcome day. to the Voxology podcast. In case you missed that, Seth Erie is playing hurt today. Guys, you oh. don't even know how, how significantly Seth is down. So he woke up this morning. He said, Dad, no podcast today. Seth has a cold. And, and in spite of that, ladies and gentlemen, Seth Erie put his shirt on, his yeah, karateka did. shirt, his house shirt from school, yeah. and he showed up playing hurt. Seth, tell us all about Thanksgiving, bro. Oh, and there's Big Nate. Big Nate's home. <laughs> Hannah's home. The whole crew's home. It's yeah. chaos. It is absolute chaos. Just pure chaos. Yeah, yeah absolute yeah. chaos. Yep. Nate Erie on the house. <laughs> yeah. Nate. Yeah. Nate Erie on the house. Yes. That's right. Seth, tell us a little bit about Thanksgiving. Um, Thanksgiving's good. It was good. Uh, uh, tomatoes. You know, we had tomatoes know. or potatoes. Potatoes. Yeah, coming out of apple juice. And, we, and they brought you apple juice. Yes, yeah, Sam. Oh, his name is Sam. Sam, yep, and his wife Angela and their kids. Now, now back to Nate. Now back to Nate. Ladies and gentlemen, Nate Erie <laughs> wants to say thank you for the fact that you guys emailed him. And um, go ahead, Nate. You want to say anything? Yeah. Um, yeah, I just want to oh. give a shout out to Uncle Brad. Um, wow. Well. Oh. First of all. But then second of all, um, wait, let me come on this side. Wow. Second of all, you know, uh, I've got I've gotten some emails, and I just couldn't thank you guys enough. You know, um, I was in a dark spot. He's and not lonely those anymore. Those emails really, really, <laughs> you know, brought me to the light. Wow! So I just want to thank you guys. Um, that's what we do. That's right. That's what we do. Uh, that's all I got. Nice, ladies and gentlemen. We hope you had a wonderful and happy Thanksgiving. Tim, tell us about. I, I this is the first time I've seen Tim since Thanksgiving. So, Tim, tell us about your holiday. <laughs> um, my daughter got lice again, so... There it was, that. ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> there it was. We spent the day in isolation. Okay, that's awesome. There's like awesome. a super lice breakout going on in this area, and it's so, very fun. So you literally had nobody over. Correct. You just said, let's share a meal with the lice. We made uh, tacos. Okay, I really thought that this was going to be an uplifting conversation. You know what, though? Yesterday was Black Friday. It's true. And we got up and packed up a bunch of food, and we drove up to Truckee, which is right below Tahoe, and just a beautiful area, and we hiked through some abandoned train tunnels, Ooh. which had big icicles and huge piles of ice, and which oh, is so much fun. fun. And then we went to our favorite sushi restaurant in Truckee and had dinner, and then like you do. drove home and hit the hot tub. Well, who's hot so tub? Yesterday was a great day. My parents what? have a hot tub, so we were like, it was very cold in Truckee, surprisingly cold. Yeah. Uh, and we weren't okay. dressed for it, so on the way home, we we're like, let's let's go dip. So of the two days, you had a you had one good day. Yeah. Yeah. We just had to push it one day. But push, yes, push it one day. Whatever. Sushi. Yeah, that's. I mean, come on, people do that all the time. That's right. That's right. Thanksgiving is a state of mind. It's not a day. That's what I'm talking about. It's like Halloween. In that That's respect. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, we're so glad that you are tuning in. Again, we're surprised anyone does. Um, and and it, we got a number of uh, emails from our last episode. Just a little, I was kind of like, I was in a revelation rut. And I told Tim, I'm like, <laughs> I, need to, I need to talk about just something else. So disappointment with God seemed appropriate. And then um, <laughs> evidently there are a whole bunch of you wrestling with similar things. Yeah, oh, a lot of I got emails. my fan. I got my fan on. I mean, turn, turn off your fan, fan man. Yeah, mm. ladies and gentlemen, we are exactly 55 minutes away from the start of the Ohio State Michigan game. So That's this is going to be a really so fast. tight podcast. <laughs> 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 we didn't record on Friday. We're recording on Saturday right before the biggest game of, of the year, at least if you're right. an Ohio State or Michigan fan. Um, but ball. we got some great emails. And, um, and so I wanted to read a couple, and that will take us into our topic for today. Um, the first one is uh, from someone in New Jersey. Guys, happy Thanksgiving. Your podcast has been instrumental in illuminating the kind of gospel I've been searching for, the Jesus way. 
Thank you for delivering that message on so many topics. But think about your recent podcast segment where you were discussing being appointed, disappointed with God and all the brands of prosperity. <laughs> Or appointed by God, which, you know, in Jeremiah's case was the same thing. There you go. Uh, I've been thinking about your recent podcast where you were discussing being disappointed with God and all the brands of prosperity gospel we have come to expect from God with our perceived faithfulness. Prosperity economics, prosperity sex, prosperity marriage, prosperity children, prosperity jobs, and so many more. That's so well said. That's mm -hmm. absolutely right. Your discussion continues to remind me we can do everything right and still have a really hard life. Right. That sucks. Um, I have two adopted kids along with my three biological kids. And there was some part of me that thought even though they were traumatized, everything would be fine once they were officially in my nice Christian family. Nope. In all caps. Trauma has a way of infiltrating and causing chaos to so many aspects of life every day, even years later. Yep. Man, that really speaks to there. There was a big uh, push to you know uh, adopt kids out of the foster uh, care system uh, about a decade ago, and and which is a wonderful and godly and holy and beautiful thing. But I don't know that we represented the potential harm or difficult, not harm, but difficulty. Yeah. Well, there we have just a <clears throat> number of friends who have had very, very hard experiences in the midst of that. It, not, all, not, not one of them regrets doing it, right. but I, I don't know that they were prepared for how hard this was going to be. So I resonate a little bit with that. The point, he says, I'm getting to, and one of my questions centers around one of the ways that I absorbed this prosperity message was through the praise and worship songs I sing each Sunday. The message is always that God is good and everything always works out. The, the name of, my, of the Lord is my strong tower. The righteous run into it, they are saved. And then he says, are they? <laughs> Not usually from where I stand. I can't reconcile so many songs with my lived reality and the reality of so many I know. Is it blasphemous to suggest that even though some of the Psalms can be head scratchers, the troubles are hardly lifted, the enemies never slain, the only way out seems to be through. The human condition can be filled with so much suffering and sorrow. Do you have any thoughts about our usual worship songs in this regard? Do they portray God and the Christian life rightly? And, and Tim's very <laughs> clear answer on this is? Absolutely. Not. No, yeah. Not. No. And, and to, so Tim, as a, as a worship leader, and then I have, I have a dear friend named Tim that I... Um, I work with at uh, this church in, in Tennessee, we are constantly, we're having to write our own songs. Yeah, which is awesome. Because, well, it's, we have just a talented crew, but, but we're, we're not satisfied. Like the range, the emotional range of the, the predominant worship songs right now is so narrow. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and hallelujah, there is room as we're going to see in a second, there is room for praise and just sheer thankfulness and declaration of goodness and life makes sense and it's ordered and God is good. Um, but that seems to be the predominant diet emotionally. And, right. um, and, and, you know, my dear emailer, you have answered your own question. You know, they don't represent, <laughs> you know, it, man, you know, it Christians <clears throat> in America don't, do suffering suffering means you've done something wrong or you're weak or yeah you need more faith or something man who who would end it like an easter service with just not ha oh happy day you know <laughs> which is how they always end totally totally i mean come on of course it all works out in the end and and while that sentiment you know yes it's true the bible never rushes us to push through our grief and sorrow to get there and but christians do and um our, our church gatherings reflect a shiny happy faith that does not match the vast majority of our lived experience yeah you agree with that i would do very much so we're gonna i actually <clears throat> put together some content about this so oh, yeah you did oh yeah
Tim was like, dude, you need to check out the emails this week. So I checked them out and I was like, ooh, we need to do something on this. So that, so your answer is coming, <laughs> but it's going to come in tandem with another answer to another email. So Holy moly. I know. We have so many great, great people. Um, so this person has given us permission to read this. So did the other one. He gave us permission in the email. But I asked specifically for this one. He said, first... Um, Listening to the podcast has been keeping my faith afloat. But the main reason I'm reaching out is because I don't know who else to come to with my question. I don't feel like I can be real and open with people in my life. Maybe even in my church community. I just feel so broken all the time and so tired. I struggle daily with my relationship with God. And at times I'm angry and want nothing to do with him. I don't know what to do. I feel that this is wrong and I don't, and I know I want to love him, but I can't let go. I just can't trust. I see everyone around me living their lives. They pour into their various passions and interests. They have ministries and want to do things. For me, I just don't want to do anything. Thankfully, I'm not suicidal. That was a temptation more strongly felt in my past, but I just can't break through. I want to be better, to do more, to experience life and God's love, to pour into my talents, if I have any, to serve, to help, to create something. I just feel so done, so tired. I just want to give up on myself, my relationships, on any sort of hope. Sabbath is unfortunately a pipe dream, pipe dream in my current stage of life, and I'm 0 for 3 with a therapist. The rigmarole that I have to endure with my health insurance to see someone is a major hindering factor. Yeah. It, amen to that. I just don't know what to do. I don't know how to find hope. I really don't think I understand how Jesus provides this hope. Mm -hmm. Maybe the gospel is too abstract for me. Maybe it's just too hard for me to really believe. I know this isn't your lane, but I was hoping you'd be able to give some wisdom perspective to someone like me. Thanks. Heavy duty. <sighs> yeah. So as always, we just sit for a second and we go, that sucks. This yeah. totally sucks. I am so sorry. We are so sorry. And um, there's no cliche that's going to work here. There's no Bible verse that's going to make everything suddenly okay. And we just have massive respect for your honesty and your willingness to not only share this with us, but to share this with some in our audience who know exactly what this feels like. This is a very, <clears throat> I've been hearing this sentiment a lot. Like, it, I don't know if we're, I'm not sure how old this emailer is, but there seems to be, in my circles, quite a few people who are landing in this spot right now, just feeling hopeless, feeling mm -hmm. spun out, feeling stuck. Yeah, or just kind of like, I don't want to say blind, but like unable to see, just feeling like you're in the fog or like a... yeah. Yep. A difficulty to navigate. <clears throat> yep. And all the rhetoric that you grew up with is not a, a map work. that's getting you out of there. Dude, that's a great way to put that. Yes. So what I wanted to do was to take the idea of how modern Christianity, at least in my experience, not everywhere, in, in, in Tim and I's kind of small subculture experience, how we sort of keep Christianity wrapped in a pretty red bow and talk how do you how do you express faith and give hope to people who feel absolutely hopeless hmm. and who have tried therapy i mean man it is so hard to find a good therapist absolutely and the the insurance stuff is awful awful yeah. i totally get that so um so i i'd love to do a bit of talking that isn't designed in any way shape or form to fix because there is no fixing yeah um there's nothing that we're going to say that's going to be like, oh, yeah, okay, this is how it works now. All the mysteries are gone and all the problems are solved. Neither, I mean, both Tim and I have been in this dark space. I've been, I've had to preach and I've been just sobbing, you know, behind the stage before I have to go up just going, how in the world am I ever going to do this? I don't even yeah. believe this. So, um I, the biggest thing and, and, the, and the gratitude for us is thank you that you give words to something a lot of us are feeling. And the reason I wanted to read it was so that everyone 
else would know they're not alone because I think, yeah. as Tim said, there are a whole bunch of us. So I want to do a little bit of Bible stuff, and then um, and the goal is not fixing. The goal is to give us a set of categories that then we'll use to talk about this. All right? Nice. So one of my so- favorite psalms is Psalm 88. I'm going to read it in, in its entirety. Lord, you are the God who saves me. Day and night, I cry out to you. It's a strong start. May my prayer come before you. Turn your ear to my cry. Absolutely resonate with that. I am overwhelmed with troubles and my life draws near to death. I am counted among those who go to the pit. Now the pit here represents Sheol or death. I am like one without strength. I am set apart with the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave, who you remember no more, who are cut off from your care. And then, and then there's a dark turn. You have put me in the lowest pit, in the darkest depths. Your wrath lies heavily on me. You have overtaken me with all your waves. You have taken me from my closest friends and have made me repulsive to them. I am confined and cannot escape. My eyes are dim with grief. I call to you, Lord, every day. I spread out my hands to you. Do you show your wonders to those who are dead? Do their spirits rise up and praise you? And the expected answer here is no, of course not. Is your love declared in the grave? Is your faithfulness declared in destruction? Are your wonders known in the place of darkness or your righteous deeds in the land of oblivion? He's saying, why do you have me here among people who cannot appreciate you? Are your wonder, or he says, but I cry to you for help, Lord. In the morning, my prayer comes before you. Why, Lord, do you reject me and hide your face from me? From my youth, I have suffered and have been close to death. I have borne your terrors and am in despair. Your wrath has swept over me. Your terrors have destroyed me. All day long, they surround me like a flood. They have completely engulfed me. You have taken from me friend and neighbor. Darkness is my only friend. And then it ends. <laughs> God never <clears throat> speaks. There's no pretty red bow. There's no answer. There's no explanation. God is the one who's blamed and to be considered at fault. And God never responds. Or one of my other favorites, Psalm 137. To set the stage for Psalm 137, this was written after the destruction of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, as you know, was considered the center of the universe by the Israelites. It was the proof that they were God's chosen people because Yahweh dwelt there. He made his abode there. And so what you, would, what, what, what you had are festivals, yearly um, festivals, where th- hundreds of thousands would converge on Jerusalem and they would sing psalms of ascent because Jerusalem was up on a plateau. So as you were climbing up the plateau, you would sing these psalms. And every day at the temple, there would be lute players and lyre players and and musicians that would be singing songs. And I mean, it was just this, just festival for the senses. And, um, And so Jerusalem gets destroyed and we have, we literally have no category. I mean, Independence Day, that movie when they destroyed the White House, <laughs> you know, in a silly way that was as close as we've ever come. I mean, we just have no conception of what the destruction of the temple was like. And um, you had all of these trained musicians who were now among the castoffs and the exiles to Babylon. And what Babylon did is they destroyed the city and then they just took the best and the brightest. If you were an artist, if you were an intellectual, if you were a young man or woman, they took you, often they castrated the men, they gave them foreign, the names of foreign gods, uh, and they raised them in the Babylonian courts. And this psalm is literally the, the psalm that I think of, uh, this first line. It, it says, Psalm 137, by the rivers... Of Babylon, we sat 
and wept when we remembered Zion, Jerusalem. There on the poplars, we hung our harps. Man, I get chills. By the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept. There on the poplars, we hung our harps. For there our captors asked us for songs, and our tormentors demanded songs of joy. Sing us one of the songs of Jerusalem, they would say. How can we sing the songs of the Lord in a foreign land? If I forget you, Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill. May my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you. If I do not consider Jerusalem my highest joy, remember, Lord, what the Edomites did on the day Jerusalem fell. Tear it down, they cried. Tear it down to its foundations. Daughter Babylon, doomed to destruction. Happy is the one who repays you according to what you have done to us. Happy is the one who seizes your infants and dashes them on the rocks. And scene. <laughs> God never speaks. No red bow. No explanation. Now, there has been a lot of discussion about why it is that in some of the prophetic literature, Habakkuk, the book of Lamentations, and certainly in the psalm literature, there are so many of these protest psalms or songs. Yeah. And it's, it's been confounding that um, American Christianity really doesn't focus a lot on these. <laughs> but the Bible spends loads of time giving room for this sort of lament. A guy named Walter Brueggemann, who we've had on the show a couple of years ago, by the way, um, divided the Psalms into three different categories. And the categories, at least for me, have been really, really helpful in kind of understanding a little bit of the life of faith and the role of suffering in it. So um, he groups them into Psalms of orientation, Psalms of disorientation, and then Psalms of reorientation, All right? <laughs> Psalms of orientation, disorientation, reorientation. So Psalms of orientation, all right? Life is good and well-ordered. God is good and always good. All is right in the world and we delight in the rich blessings of God. It reflects a settled faith. God is known to be reliable and trustworthy. Everything is is as it should be. It is a happy, <laughs> blessed state of confidence in, the, in, in God's relational capacities to delight in us and us to delight in God. Life is not troubled or threatened. It's clear. It's black and white, good and bad. There are several different types of psalms of orientation. There are songs of creation that just appreciate how beautiful and ordered God's creation is. There are songs of Torah, that, that talk about how beautiful and ordered Torah is. There are wisdom psalms that present a really black and white universe. If you do this, then this will happen to you. And if yeah. you don't do this, then this bad thing will happen to you. All of those are psalms of what Brueggemann calls orientation. There, we, life is good. It's settled. God is relatable. It's predictable. Everything is good. All right, so here's a psalm of orientation. This is Psalm 145. And, and listen to the words. There are times and seasons where this, you know, is true. We mean this. I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. And I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome works. I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. All your works extol you, Lord. Your faithful people extol you. They tell the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might, so that all people might know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your dominion endures through all generations. 
The Lord is trustworthy in all he promises and faithful in all he does. The Lord upholds all who fall and lifts all who are bowed down. There, the eyes of all look to you and you give them food at the proper time. This is, this is settled, reliable creation. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways, as faithful as all he does. The Lord is near to those who call on him. I love that. So different from what we just read in Psalm 88. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cry and saves them. He watches over those who love him and the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak in the praise of the Lord. Let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever. Right? A psalm of orientation. Yeah. And we have been, at least I have been, in those places where it is clear, it is good, it is settled, it is peaceful, it is right, everything is in its proper place. A psalm of orientation. And these are legit. Like, th there's nothing bad about seeing the world this way and feeling the world this way. Right. Then he introduces <laughs> psalms of disorientation. We've already met two of them. Yeah. Psalm 88, Psalm 137. Here's just a, a short one, Psalm 13. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long was, must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? See, that's, that's our emailer. How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look at me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say, I've overcome him and my foes will rejoice when I fall. Psalms of lament reflect that life also consists of seasons of hurt, alienation, suffering, death, and, and rage, resentment, self-pity, hatred <clears throat> are provoked by those emotions. seasons. Yes. There is no equilibrium. The world has come crashing down. Jerusalem was destroyed. How could we sing songs of Zion? Are you kidding me? I wish Babylon, I wish all the infants in Babylon would be crushed against the rocks. There's your song, right? I mean, wow. Psalms of disorientation are marked by disequilibrium. Life doesn't make sense. Incoherence. Nothing fits together. It's all out of whack. Unrelieved asymmetry. God, I'm so committed to you and you're not committed to me. If the church, this is from Brueggemann, if the church goes on singing happy songs in the face of this reality, it is doing something very different than what the Bible itself does. And dangerous and destructive. And harmful. And, That's yeah. right. This goes back to our first emailer. Yeah. Our worship should reflect the worship of the entire people of God, not consumer, individualistic, therapeutic, prosperous, Americanized Christianity. Well, I saw a meme yesterday that said, don't, mm -hmm. don't dine at the tables that Jesus overturned or something like that. Like a... <laughs> totally. Now, Psalms of reorientation. There is hope in the darkness. Psalms of reorientation, it's, it's, it's Yahweh's intrusion into circumstances that are far beyond our control. It's, it's um, newness of life in the midst of the stench of death. It's a reversal of fortune or an inversion of what's considered normal. It's never, ever going back to orientation, hmm. but it's going through to reorientation. Reorientation psalms acknowledge disorientation and that God brought me through it. And that I stand on the other side of that way differently than I was when I was in orientation. Does that make sense? Totally. And, and, um, and so like Psalm 30, I will exalt you, Lord. Why? Because you're always good? No, you lifted me out of the depths. I called you for help and you healed me. You brought me up from the realm of the dead and you spared me from going to the pit. His anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a nighttime. When I felt secure, I said, I will never be shaken. 
Lord, when you favored me, you made my moral, royal mountain stand firm. But when you hid your face, I was dismayed. Do you see the difference? Mm -hmm. Like, God, I was in orientation and you, like, everything worked. And then you hid your face from me and I was dismayed. To you, Lord, I called. To the Lord, I cried for mercy. God, what is gained if I am silenced? If I go down to the pit, will the dust praise you? Will it proclaim your faithfulness? Hear, Lord, and be merciful to me. Lord, be my help. You turn my wailing into dancing. You remove my sackcloth and clothe me with joy, that my heart may sing your praises and not be silent. So reorientation is where we come back to seeing God's faithfulness, but his faithfulness wasn't in the absence of suffering. It right. was in the midst of it. And it was his presence in it, not his the relief from the suffering that was the issue. And so <clears throat> another Brueggemann quote, It is curious that the church has, by and large, continued to sing songs of orientation in a world increasingly experienced as disoriented. And, you know, back to your point, that becomes very, very, very harmful. So... What Brueggemann's typology does is it introduces, into some, introduces us into something we've talked about before called lament. Lament is at passive acceptance. None of this is passively accepting. See, th and this is so important. This is not passive resignation. None of those of, categories. None of them. Yeah. Now, surrender is easy in orientation because it's all, it's all great. Mm -hmm. Surrender is really hard and it usually takes the form of protest. God, this isn't fair. Where are you? It assumes, the thing about lament is that it assumes the goodness of God. And it doesn't say, God, I really think you're a horrible person. It's God, if you're good and you are good, why aren't you moving here? Mm -hmm. Right? It, it assumes, it's within the covenant context. And so it, it's different than complaining. The Israelites complained all over the place. Lament is different. Lament has a different kind of orientation. It's, it's pointing out what is out of order in God's good world and then saying, Yahweh, you have the power to fix this. Remember what you did at the Red Sea? Do that here. Mm -hmm. Remember what you did in creation? Do that here. Remember how you calmed the sea monsters? Do that here. And, and so you'll get all of this stuff invoked from previous Old Testament stories. And it'll be like, Yahweh, you've done this. Do this again. And on the other side of that, because we do believe there is hope, like, but it's not cliched hope. It's not hopefulness. It's a, a hope, as Paul talks about in Romans 5, it's a hope that comes through disappointment and suffering. That Yahweh is big enough to handle it. And it doesn't mean we're spared from it. It means that somehow we're held in it. And that doesn't mean anything when you're in it. But when you get through it, you look back on it and go, oh, Oh, okay. I couldn't see God in the midst of my torment. But looking back at it, I can see some of his fingerprints in the midst of the torment. Yeah. But I couldn't see it in the meantime. You know, so much of God, life with God only makes sense in the rearview mirror. You know? So reorientation isn't cheering myself up in the midst of it. Reorientation is looking back on it and going, oh, he wasn't absent even though he felt absent. He wasn't silent, even though he felt silent. Thoughts, Timothy? I see the wheels. I see him. <clears throat> it's just hard. It's a really hard conversation because I think so much of our theology has been built on a foundation that dictates opposite of this. So it's like, it's not just like an encouragement of, hey, I know things are rough. I don't, you know what? It's, we're just, it's, it's just, there's a lot of like over like monumental reorientation that almost has yes. to happen because our theology is built on an idea that of the, uh, it's built on this music that the first emailer was right. questioning. Right. Like our theology is off. So it's really hard to become dis disoriented and then become reoriented when our American theology is often built on a foundation that doesn't, doesn't, doesn't acknowledge disorientation yeah. totally so it's just that's a really difficult play. Yes. like if you're in a disoriented mood like if life or 
or whatever has put you into a season of disorientation, but your theology is still built upon a foundation that that's not a real thing. That's yep. terrifying. Like you're just well, that's, spinning. That's what the second emailer said. The first thing he said was, I know it's not your lane, but I feel like this is the only place I can go with my questions. Right. I can't even go to my church. Right. And, and that's, that's the fruit yeah. of the first emailer's observation, which yeah. is a Christianity built entirely on orientation. And, yeah. oh, it just, just crushes me because it's so, it's, it takes one tiny slice of the biblical worldview yeah. and, and blows it up into the whole thing. And it's awful. There, there is this, this persidious Whoa. Persidious? How about pervasive and insidious? Insidious? <laughs> pervasive, like insidious a, lie. It's like a persidious. It's a persidious word. <laughs> yes to go. Yes to go is Seth's favorite word. There is this weird lie in religious communities that God wants us to be polite and to be happy. And that the goal of Christianity, we're doing it wrong if we're miserable and we're... Um, we're, we're full of anger, darkness, questions. And what, what, the reason I wanted to bring Brueggemann up here is to talk to the second emailer and say, what you, ex what you are experiencing is a normal part of faith. Now, I know that sounds cliche, and I hate myself for even saying it, but it, it actually is true that God hasn't abandoned you here that God hasn't given up on you. This is not your fault. This is not something God is doing to teach you a lesson. This is like part, this is part of how it goes and it sucks and it's no fun and you're not alone. And, it, yeah. and I can also say beyond a shadow of a doubt, it won't always be this way. I have no idea how it will change, when it will change, what will change. I just know that it won't always be this way. But the first thing we have to do is acknowledge that what you're feeling right now I don't, I don't like God. I don't trust God. I'm not sure I believe in God. The gospel is nothing. The Bible is dust. Prayer is meaningless. That is not a lack of faith. That is part of, I mean, that is, that is part of the faith experience of millions and millions of Jesus people. And so the, the worst thing you can do in that dark place is draw conclusions about how, what God is how God is oriented to you in the midst of that. We talked about this a little bit too. I think, I think the title of the episode, if I remember was a Bruce <clears throat> Springsteen song. Oh, is, um, did we cover this typology? In a, a previous episode? A long time ago, but oh, okay. the, there was know. an episode where we were talking about, um, I think the title of the episode was something like if I should fall behind, cause there's a Springsteen oh, nice. song. If I should fall behind, wait for me. And we were talking about how different moments, in time we each of us will fall each of us will something will happen and it's in this you know if you picture a group of people walking on that you know long road together as one person falls people stop and help that person up and then when mm. it's their turn we stop and lift them up and when it's my turn you stop and lift me yes up. so there's something to be said about so i had a couple of thoughts when you were going through the brigham and stuff one of them is that that like um uh, do, doing disorientation in community is a very doing disorientation on your own from experience can be a very just the wrong way to approach it because you yeah. just end up in a hole by yourself in the dark and the cold wondering why it's so dark and cold but with no one to experience that with or to work it through with and so the wisdom of just having peers around you that can, you know, lament with you, that can cry with you, that can do all the kind of things that are human responses to do it with you while helping to move forward or whatever. And I know that can also be hard if you can't find community. And that's been a lament that we've gotten in a lot of emails from people is I can't mm -hmm. find a community, do you know, mm -hmm. a community in this area. I can't find a church that isn't doing this old version of things that isn't helpful, which is why we were trying to do the, community groups and that kind of stuff is I would just encourage you to find mm -hmm. like fellow journey people that can march in the dark with you because it's just, it's just too hard on your own. You just can't, yeah. <laughs> you just can't do it on your own. 
And this yeah. is coming from the, the introverted introvert who wants to do everything on their own. Like if anyone has ever wanted to just be by themselves and do things on their own, it's me. And I, so it's yeah. been a very hard lesson for me to learn that I need people around me. The other thing I was thinking about is like, how often does the Bible talk about intent within worship, like in Amos mm. or in mm. Corinthians where, you know, just like you're a banging gong or your, your songs mean nothing to me. There's this idea of intent within why we do what we do, why we sing what we sing, why we gather together. I think that applies in orientation. I think that applies in the really good times when we're, why are we singing the songs that we're singing? Um, is it we, because we think that there's this big white haired, white bearded person in the clouds that needs us to just continue to sing praises. Like he has batteries are low and he needs to be recharged <laughs> by our praises. Or is there something more to it? Yeah. You know, does he need our praises or are we praising because of something? Are we, and what's the intent behind that? But the same thing with the lamentations, like the sitting by the river in Babylon, which is so funny that that song was made most famous by Sublime. Oh, the, really? Yeah, they have it on oh, 40 Ounce to Freedom. They sing that song. It's an older, like there's an older um, reggae band that kind of did it first, but Sublime popped it. So it's just, it's such a funny <laughs> correlation, but. Um, <laughs> That's funny. I've never. The intent, that. there's just so much intent involved in even lament or in praise or it's like, why do we do what we do? Why do we sing what we sing? What do we see? And then that made me think of Easter and we just recently mm. touched on this, but that oh, the whole thing that you brought up last time about like looking at the world and proclaiming he has risen, he has risen indeed when you're in the face of hopelessness. Totally. But there, the hope, sometimes there is no like yeah. tenuous strands to gra grab onto that enable you to really see or feel the hope. Sometimes yeah. you look to your neighbor and you say, you know what? I know that he has risen. I put my hope there. Yeah, We respond to that and we keep pushing forward. Yeah. In the mud, in the muck, in the mire. I mean, I remember U 2s forty, growing mm. up in the church that I grew up in, where there was no lament songs, and then hearing that U two song on war. How long must we sing this song? Mm. You mm. know, all this stuff, and it's just like, wait, that's a Bible verse that he's singing. That's yeah. a psalm. Uh, that's yes. a praise song. And so being being very young and trying to wrestle with, you can't <laughs> sing that. That's not worship. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. This sucks. What does that mean? How long is yes. it going to suck? What does that mean? Yes. Yes. So those are all See, really. That's, that's what lament does. Lament, it, 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 we don't dismiss or deny or avoid sorrow. We yes. sit in it. We, it's, it, that's the hardest thing because dripping through our, our dear friend's email, that second email is, I, I should feel better. I want to feel differently. And yes, <clears> amen. <throat> let's pray for relief like entirely. Yeah. But there's also this sense that if I'm feeling this way, then something is radically wrong yeah. with my Christian life. And I want to go, I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, not necessarily. Now th there could be mental illness. There could be uh, too much isolation. I mean, of course there could be a thousand contributing issues. And if we were sitting together talking about this, I I would just want to ask all sorts of other questions and and not to diagnose or fix, but just to hear and see you yeah. in the and midst that's the of community this. aspect of this. Well, bro, so so my favorite part of the Chronicles of Narnia, <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna hit 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 this or hit it's you Eustace, with this. Eustace, not Edmund. It's Eustace, not Edmund. <clears throat> yeah, bro, don't listen. You got to get your facts straight. Tim and so many things. So <laughs> this is in Prince Caspian. And um, let me set this sucker up. And I'm not I'm not gonna do it justice, but if you've if you've not if you're not familiar with the Chronicles of Narnia, four British school children find themselves <laughs> magically transported, their family, uh, two boys, two girls, uh, they're transported into this land called Narnia that um, animals talk. And there is a white witch and there is a uh, white witch figure who is kind of the Satan figure. And then there's the Aslan figure who is like the great lion, the Jesus figure. And there's, you know, it's, it's a fine story, but there's a ton of really interesting and good theology and really profound <laughs> stuff kind of smuggled into this children's story. 
And one and and um, so I had this pointed out to me years ago, and it totally changed how I walk through suffering. So um, the the school children are on a quest. They're with a dwarf. the The dwarf is taciturn and not really sure he believes in Aslan. They don't they don't just show up and Aslan's right there. Often they're called to do something. And Lucy, who's the youngest, and she has kind of the the most childlike faith. They're, they're at, a, at the top of a hill, and there are two paths. There's a, there's a path that goes down and looks easy, and there's a path that goes up and looks very difficult. Lucy, of all of the, their party, the other kids and the dwarf, Lucy's the only one that sees Aslan across the way telling them to go up in, in the difficult path. And Lucy says, guys, Aslan's telling us to go up. And they all look to where Lucy's pointing. They can't see him. And the dwarf is like, dude, Aslan's not even real to begin with. So she gets outvoted because going down looks so much easier. So they go down and, you know, shockingly, there's loads of trouble waiting for them down. So they come back up at the end of the day and they're exhausted. They're angry. They're frustrated. Lucy's been like, dude, I told you guys. They all go to bed uh, tired and, and frustrated. Lucy wakes up in the middle of the night and, and she just hears a voice. She kind of walks into this clearing and there he is. There's Aslan, his first appearance in the book. And, and there's this great line. It's like, she says, Aslan, you look bigger. And Aslan says, well, that's because you are. And she mm. says, huh? And he says, every year you grow, you will find me bigger, which is Ooh. such a beautiful image. Yeah. And, then, and then he's like, hey, we've, Aslan says, we've wasted a lot of time today. She's like, yeah, I know. They didn't believe me. And she starts bragging on her older brothers and sisters. And Aslan's like, he just starts, he kind of has this growl. He's like, you could have followed. Even if no one else came, you could have followed. Mm. And he said, or she, she said, you know, she, she goes sort of, there, this is cool, like connecting relational exchange that they have. And then, and then he says, you need to go wake up your brothers and sisters and tell them to come. And, um, and she's terrified because it's middle of the night. They already hate her. <laughs> she's annoying. Poor um, Lou. Yeah, poor Lou. And so Lou, Lou wakes them up and they are just fussing at her like crazy. And she finally just says, well, I'm leaving. You can come with me or not. And because she's the youngest, they all feel obligated. So they start following Lucy. Lucy is the only one that can see Aslan. The rest of them can't see anything. So they have to trust Lucy's sight. And they don't. But the interesting thing in Lewis's story is that the longer they follow Lucy the more clearer they begin to see Aslan. Hmm. So, so they had to follow the person who saw Aslan before they could see him themselves. And the, the lesson I got from that was when you can't see or when you can't hear, be around trusted and gentle guides who can see and who yeah. can hear. And at, at some point you will be able to see and hear again yourself. Now, I'm just, I'm just using that to really provide an exclamation point to your point, Tim, about community. Uh, there was a, a moment, there have been two or three moments in my life where I've been in the grip of such mental illness, depression, anxiety, all of the awfulness, that I've, I've literally felt out of control. Just yeah. out of control. I mean, just outside myself, insane. I just felt crazy. And there was a friend of mine who, um, w w when I was in the middle of that, um, he was new to our staff, but he had he was he had he had walked orientation and disorientation, right. and was sitting in reorientation. And so he was he he just came over. I was I was out of my mind. He came over and he just sat with me in my backyard in Tustin, California. I remember this so clearly. And he just listened and he saw me and he would just say, it's not always going to be this way. It's not yeah. always going to be this way. Don't, no fixing. It's just not always going to be this way. And he saw what I could not. And he heard what I could not. And I tell you the truth of all of the fixings that were offered me, the simple act of him sitting there present with me in my absolute craziness was the, the gift I will always remember. 
And, um, and so what I would want for you, dear emailer, whether it's us from a distance or someone close who can simply walk a step ahead of you and say, yep, I still see, I still hear, we're in this together. Your, your, your doubt and darkness and the crazy hairball of all those emotions, they don't scare me. None of those scare me. I've been there. I felt them. God knows them. They're, none of this is scary. It doesn't have to be scary because it, it's, all, it's all taken into account already. Um, man, I would want that for you. Yeah. And I don't know how best you know to do that. But for me, that was where I saw exactly what Tim was talking about. Somebody who sits in reorientation is totally comfortable with people in disorientation. That's how you know. If you're in orientation or reorientation, because in orientation, people in disorientation scare you. They're becoming oh, totally. liberal. They are they are uh, falling oh, away. Lost their faith. Yeah, totally. In reorientation, you're sitting there going, you know, and All so <laughs> so what that guy was to me, we want to just be that voice to you for just a second to say, we hear and we see, and and it is worth it. It is worth it. There is something of substance that you're going to land on. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. God really is all the things that we say. But the American church doesn't witness to that God well. It witnesses to a different kind of God. And, 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 and the witnessing to that consumeristic, individualistic, prosperity kind of God makes the suffering you're going through even worse. Because yeah, there's I wonder, this should. Is Go it... Ahead. And I don't know if this is the was part of the reason. Do you think part of the reason that God's like experiment or his him becoming man, becoming human, was part of it to do you think to experience like <clears throat> what this what hopelessness or suffering or those kind of things feel like? Because I know we've talked about it in different lenses, like. Um, you know, he goes and experiences temptation. So we had a whole conversation uh, a couple of years ago, probably where I was asking you, like, do you think that Jesus was tempted by things like lust, but perhaps chose against them? Um, and it was in part of the conversation of sin being missing the mark of humanity and that kind of stuff that Jesus experienced. He goes in the desert and experiences the temptations that a lot of which were specifically what we were hoping for from him. Uh, and he resists those temptations. So he comes down and he kind of experiences that. But he also like, I can, when we have these conversations, I can never not think about the garden of Gethsemane and the, mm -hmm. and what's happening in there and how inconclusive or how it's just mm -hmm. this moment, but mm -hmm. we, ex but we see Jesus experience this very intense emotion mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. with Lazarus or with different things like that, where it was like, mm -hmm. we see a very human lament or a very human, like, response from him in those mm -hmm. moments and i mm -hmm. and i wonder how much of that is and i don't i mean that's a, probably an impossible question to answer but it, there's something profound that always yeah like rises or get, it gets like uh yeah kind of drummed up in me when we have these conversations like yeah i don't know what he was experiencing in the garden but it seems profound and it yeah. seems pretty heavy and then it's like how important is so yesterday when we were in the train tunnels, it was freezing, like just mm -hmm. ice. I was, I didn't dress appropriately. I was cold. I was worried we were going to miss our dinner uh, reservation when they opened. And so I was not fully experiencing kind of what we were doing. And then um, my 11 year old is just like walking next to me and he's just like, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. This is so amazing. This it just <laughs> over and over and over. And I had to like, I had to stop and just kind of sit in his words mm. to experience the wonder mm. of what we were doing. And he's very much, he's young. He's in an orientation kind of place. There is a lot of wonder and intrigue and um, that kind of stuff. And I've often have lost that. So I wonder how sometimes important that daisy chain is from in a community of people from orientation to reorientation to remember what yeah. disorientation is like and that it's important. Yes, and that there are important. real things in there that that uproot you from a place that is maybe not whole. Ooh, or, ooh, yeah. 
That's and then so good. It's important for us to kind of have that chain all the way through, but that only can happen when you're surrounded by other people. Yeah. That are in those different places. And yes. Yeah. Seth, Seth is that to me. I love that. Elliot, bro. Yeah. <clears throat> bro. Seth is that. Absolutely. There's not a bit of disorientation of that boy at all, except where are my chicken nuggets? <laughs> Which is real. It, dude, the struggle is real. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. And, and again, when you're in disorientation, you, you usually can't stand people in orientation. So one of the ways totally. that you know you're in reorientation is that you're gracious with both. Yeah. And you realize you need both. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's not that you've arrived at all. It's that there's room in your emotional space for each. Yeah. You know? One um, other thing, one last thing. The, um, if it. you search for it, and we've had this conversation in different contexts. Um, I think I asked both Gombus and Caitlin Shess when, when they were on about like, how do you see the spirit move? And it was often through mm -hmm. um, looking at marginalized communities. There is music coming out of a lot of marginalized communities that you can find. Um, I, I was collecting stuff on a, <laughs> on a playlist that I was calling broken worship. And it'll be from the LGBTQ community. It'll be from um, communities of color, different communities that have been marginalized. There's music coming out of there. That's not empty um, rhetoric, empty praise. It's rooted in struggle. It's rooted in justice. It's rooted in lament and asking hard questions and, but still seeking within that kind of stuff. Like, yeah. I've been shunned. I've been put out. I've been made less than. I've been made othered. I've been othered by Ooh. your children. But still, I'm looking to you. So there is music out there that is reflecting this conversation. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. You just got to dig a little bit. And it's not as like yeah. big and bombastic and like, you know, which is why I just yeah. did that waving my arms. It makes me think of those like parking lot <laughs> things. Like that's what worship is like this empty. <laughs> air filled and there and there's a place and there is such a place there like, is but that intent, we don't want to right? despise that. that yes 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 we don't want to despise that we don't be we don't want to be the two old muppets up there <laughs> yelling at the kids i love those guys though i know those are the best guys anyway all right brothers and sisters game time in two minutes i may be i may be oriented or disoriented depending on how the next three hours of the game. Goes. <laughs> yeah. That's why we're recording this beforehand. I'm going mini golfing, so I will only be oriented. Oh, perfect. Mini golfing is so good. But listen, um, especially to that second emailer, Jeremy, we call all of our male names Jeremy. Um, we'd love your thoughts. If you want to email back and let us know how this hits you or any other thoughts you have, whether you want them shared or not, is there material? We'd love your thoughts to our thoughts yeah. because. Love for this to be more than just a one. Even if we can't thing. respond to every email, we've been reading every email. Yeah, yeah, we love you guys. Anyway, till next time, friends. Go Bucks. <laughs>